I went away for a few weeks in the growing season, and the person who was looking after them fed them the wrong feed. Mm. How a plant grows and produces depends on what it's fed. And that's equally applies to the spiritual world. Amen. Especially when someone is in the early stages of Christianity. Right. So I want to share some thoughts tonight that I've gathered regarding how we can help Christians grow and develop. Chuck Swindle, in his book, Growing Deep, in the Christian tells us that they were making an around-the-world voyage in an old maid boat. And without exception, exception, everyone who was on the pier was vocally pessimistic. Everyone was telling him everything that could possibly go wrong. The sun will boil you, you won't have enough food, that boat of yours won't stand up in the storm. You'll never make it. And a man standing nearby heard all these discouraging words and decided instead to offer some words of encouragement. And as the little boat began pulling away from the shore, he went to the end of the pier and began waving both his arms wildly and shouting, Bon voyage, you're really something. We're with you, we're proud of you, good luck, brother. That story, by the way, is so similar to our lives. Because most of us are on a journey. And it's a long journey, it's the journey of life. And we're not, we don't really know how far we're going to make it. And as we go along, there will only be a very few people who will actually stand and give you encouragement. Because most are critical or negative. Have you discovered that this world that we live in is generally a critical place? It's a pretty sad commentary on life, but often it's very true about most of us that there are more discouragers in life than there are encouragers. I preparing for this tonight, was encouraged by the writings of Steve Shepard, a pastor in the United States. You see, many people are better at discouraging others than encouraging them. Mm. Let me give you an example. One three-year study found out that most school teachers were 75% negative and critical when they were dealing with pupils. The study also indicated that it takes four positive comments to offset the effect of one negative yeah. comment. Right. Yeah. So just one negative comment can put somebody down and it will take four encouraging words to get them back up again. Yeah. But there's another side to the coin. Again, I'm talking about somebody going on a sailing trip. It was in 1965, some of you won't even remember that. A 13 and a half foot boat quietly left the marina at Falmouth, Massachusetts. And its destination was England. It was going to be the smallest boat that ever made that trip. The name, you might remember it, those who are old enough, Tinkerbell. And the man sailing it was called Robert Mangry. He'd been an editor for the Cleveland paper for 10 years, and he was so bored, so he took leave of absence to fulfill his secret dream. <coughs> Robert Mangry was afraid, but he wasn't afraid of the ocean. He was afraid of all the people who were trying to talk him out of doing the trip. So he didn't tell many people, just a few relatives and his wife. His wife's name was Virginia, and she was his greatest supporter and encourager. Now the trip was anything but pleasant. He spent many sleepless nights, 
trying to cross shipping lanes without getting run down and sunk. Weeks at sea cause his food to become tasteless. Loneliness caused him to have hallucinations. His rudder broke three times. He was swept overboard, and if it hadn't been for the rope that he had tied around his waist, he would never have got back on board again. Finally, after 78 days at sea, he sailed into England. During his many nights, he fantasized how it would be as he arrived in England. He expected to simply check into a hotel, have a long dinner, and then the next morning see if the press might be interested in his story. But you see, the word of his approach has spread far and wide. And to his amazement, 300 vessels with horns blasted escorted Tinkerbell into port. And 40,000 people were there screaming and cheering for him. Robert Manley became an overnight hero. And his story has been repeated around the world many times. But I will say to you tonight that Robert Manley couldn't have done it alone. Because standing on the dock was an even greater hero, his wife Virginia. She had refused to be critical and negative about her husband's trip. She gave him constant encouragement, which enabled him to pursue and complete his dream. Church, the world needs a whole lot more of people like Virginia Manley. We want men and women who will give others the needed encouragement in their life. We need a word of encouragement. The, word, the world needs a word of encouragement. There was a pianist called Arthur Rubenstein. And he once told the story about himself. Some years ago, he had a bad case of hoarseness. The newspaper were full of reports about smoking and cancer, so he decided to go and consult a throat specialist. And Rubenstein said, I searched the doctor's face for a clue during the 30 minute examination, but it was expressionless. He told me to come back the next day. I went home full of fear. I didn't sleep that night. The next day there was another long examination and again silence. Tell me, the pianist explained. I can stand the truth. I've lived a full, rich life. What's wrong with me? And the doctor said, you talk too much. <laughs> I wonder if this is ever our problem. You know, it could be. The more we speak, the more we're likely to get into trouble, and you might not be aware of this, the more we're likely to sin. James 3. Trouble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. One of the easiest ways to sin is with our speaking, and especially the more we talk. And Proverbs, of course, Proverbs 10. When words are many, sin is not absent. But he who holds his tongue is wise. And a woman begged a friend that she could get Coolidge to speak to her. She went up to him and said, Hello, Mr. President. I bet my friend that I could get you to say three words to me. You lose, Coolidge replied and walked away. <laughs> I wonder, do we just blurt out whatever comes into our mind? Or do we stop and weigh the words before we speak? Because mm -hmm. words can be so damaging. Mm -hmm. Anne Landers once said, the trouble with talking too fast, you may say something you haven't thought of yet. Yeah. Fair comment, isn't it? 
Someone else said, the real art of conversation is not only to say the right thing at the right place, but to leave the unsaid, the wrong thing, at the tempting moment. I wonder how many of us have stuck our foot in our mouth. You know, how many of us have been like the Apostle Peter and had foot and mouth disease, yeah. where we've ended up putting our feet in our mouth. Yeah. When was the last time you took a speech examination? And by that, I mean, when was the last time you thought about your speaking habits? And I'm not talking about grammar. I'm talking about the words that we speak to others and the manner in which we speak them. Some people use mean words and they speak to others in a mean way. I believe we could all speak and do better when we're sharing with others. If one of the easiest ways to sin is with our mouth or through our speaking, then perhaps one of the easiest ways to bless people is with our mouths and by our speaking. And I back that up with Acts 13. The synagogue rulers sent word to them saying, Brothers, if you have a message of encouragement for the people, please speak. We need, all of us need to learn to speak words that will encourage others. Our brother this week has been busy, Liam. He's led three people to the Lord. Amen. 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 Encourage him. Amen. Amen. It is so easy for you and I to discourage someone or put them down. But what about lifting them up? Have you got a message of encouragement? If you have, please speak it. Ephesians 4 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Speaking words that build up people should be our goal. It's easy to pull people down, yeah. but to build people up, it takes a lot of care and a lot of work. I once emphasized this. I've got something to stand on a coffee table, and I invited them to try and pull me up very difficult but the easiest thing in the world is just to do that and to pull the person off yeah. it's so easy to pull someone down yeah. but it's not so easy to lift somebody up Colossians 4 says let your conversation be always full of grace seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone we should work and speaking gracious words to each other. If you've got a message or a word of encouragement, please speak it. Otherwise, shut up. That's it in a nutshell, isn't it? If you haven't got anything positive, encouraging to say, then shut up. Yeah. Acts, stay in Acts, Acts 13, I mean, I'm starting off on verse 16. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Men of Israel, and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. After removing Saul, he made David their king. He testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. From this man's descendant, God has brought to Israel the Saviour Jesus, as he promised. And then jump into verse 38. Therefore, my brothers, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is justified from everything you could not be justified from by the law of Moses. There's another lovely story for you. An American man won the lottery. And he hid his, his winnings from his wife. Yeah. He'd won $600,000. And she found out about it. She said, I've got a number for him. 
half. <laughs> and now Donna Campbell is suing her husband in an attempt to get it. But the American Airlines mechanic, Arnim Brandas, had disappeared after his wife confronted him. So they've got process servers chasing him now to hand in the lawsuit. And Campbell's attorney said, here's a guy who for years has spent all the marital money on the lottery and the casinos, and he's always lost. Now he's finally wins, and he's trying to keep it from his wife. That's pretty low of him. It's also pretty low for you and I if we keep good news from others. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? What am I talking about? It could be any good news. It could also be the best news ever. Any time we keep something good from people, any time we stop sharing it, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. Proverbs 11. A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. People curse the man who hoards grain or good news, but blessings crown him who is willing to sell or speak good. Another story, I've got stories tonight, by the way. One man said, My wife was fascinated by the ele elegant calligraphy on the handwritten menu in a Chinese restaurant. So she took the menu home and spent months knitting a sweater with all these Chinese characters down the front of it. And she wore it to a cocktail party. <laughs> and a Chinese physician happened to be there. And he looked at the symbols. And he said, where did you get that? And she said, from a menu. And he said, do you know what they say? I'm afraid to ask, the wife said. But tell me anyway. Cheap but good. <laughs> Suppose I found something very cheap, but also very good, and I failed to share it. How would you feel? For instance, let me talk to the men. Say I found a place where I could buy a well-known brand of clothing at 20% off the regular price. For instance, a hundred dollar suit would only cost me 20 quid. How would you feel if I never told you? How would you feel if I kept that to myself, man? If I didn't share that with you? Now, some of you couldn't care less because you don't wear a suit. <laughs> Others might feel slighted, <clears throat> cheated, even insulted that I didn't tell them. But I wonder how many people are going to feel towards us when after this life is over, we haven't bothered to tell them the good news about Jesus. Mm, yeah. Right now, some of them couldn't care less. But I tell you what, on the day of judgment, it's going to be a different matter, isn't it? Yeah. <coughs> Ronnie Hyo was went to a Christian college and he wrote, we had a great crusade in Liberia, West Africa. God blessed the preaching of the word with over 500 baptisms. God is good. Yes, God is good. He was and he's always been good. Good enough to give us the good news of Jesus so that you and I can be saved of our sins and that we can go to heaven. Amen? Amen. That's the best news that there is. And we need to share it with others. Whatever you talk about, please end up talking about Jesus. Amen. Amen. Tell a story about Jesus. Amen? Come on. Whatever you do, don't just talk about rubbish. Bring Jesus into the conversation. That's, he's an expert at it. He sits down in the bus station and brings Jesus into it. I said it this morning. They did a Research in America, I'm sorry, it's in America, 
And they asked six million people the same question. What would it take for you to go to church? And you know what the answer was? For someone to ask us. That's all it needed. Someone to ask them to go. There's a big harvest out there. <laughs> Very big harvest. Staying in Acts, Acts 13, I mean verse 42. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. And when the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and the devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honoured the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. They were urged to continue in the grace of God. They gathered to hear the word of God, and they were glad and they honoured God's word. Now to me, in this says that encouragement must lead to God, and it must always point to God. Can I talk to you about Einstein? Have you ever heard of him? Yeah. Most people have heard of Einstein. Well, he was on his sailing boat, and they were drifting back and forth, and they were talking about the nature of God, the universe, and talking about man. And suddenly Einstein lifted his head, looked up at the skies and said, we know nothing about it. Our knowledge is but the knowledge of school children. And his friend asked, Do you think that we shall ever probe the secret? Possibly we should know a little more than we do now. But the real nature of things, we shall never know, never. Einstein was wrong. And that was because he was looking in the wrong place. If he kept looking at the universe, trying to figure out its existence, he should have really been examining the Word of God, and he would have got the answer. Yeah. I love this one. Aborigines, a certain tribe of Aborigines in Australia, they can't count above three. That's as far as they can count. One, two, three, enough. That's the way they count. One, two, three, in that. They have limited their horizon in material things and they don't want to go beyond three. That's as far as they go. But if we had no knowledge, just the knowledge of God, that would be enough. Amen? Amen. Why people have got to keep cramming their heads with knowledge when they're not bothering to get the real knowledge of God? Some people are like walking libraries. Yeah. Yeah. And yet they don't know the real truth. Chuck Swindle wrote a book, as I said, Christian Life. He's got one whole chapter in it devoted to the subject of knowing God. That should be our life's major pursuit. Amen. Amen. Knowing God. Amen. Swindle wrote, I am more convinced than ever that life's major pursuit is not knowing self but knowing God. As a matter of fact, unless God is the major pursuit of our lives, all other pursuits are dead-end streets, including trying to know ourselves. They won't work. They won't satisfy. They won't result in fulfillment. They won't do for us what we think they're going to do. You never really begin the process of coming to know yourself until you begin the process of coming to know God. Amen. You won't know yourself until you know God. And I agree fully with that. Yeah. Everything revolves about knowing God. Nothing in life makes real sense unless it's connected to knowing God. The God who created us. 
And true encouragement will always point people to God. Amen. 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 There was an old preacher, a preacher of the gospel, and he was talking to a distinguished actor. They were at a social gathering. And when the actor was asked to give a reading, he stood up and repeat, repeated at the preacher's request the 23rd Psalm. He quoted it in such a way that it brought applause from everyone in the room. Then he invited the old preacher to stand up and say the psalm. And when he had finished, there was a hushed silence. Yeah. And some even had tears in their eyes. <clears throat> and the actor said, I know that psalm, but that man knows the shepherd. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Question tonight. I don't care how long you've been in church. I don't care how many times you've come to church. Do you know the Good Shepherd? Yes. That's the question. Yes. How well do you know God? We need to know God better than we know ourselves. Better than we know anyone else. We need to know God. Let me end. Someone said, Flatter me, and I may not believe you. Criticize me, and I may not like you. Ignore me, and I may not forgive you. Encourage me, and I'll never forget you. Yeah. Friends, we need to be in the business of encouraging one another. If you've got a message of encouragement, don't let anyone pull you off from speaking it. Speak it up. It doesn't. I've learned long ago, a word of encouragement hasn't got to be a sermon. It can literally be one sentence. And it can lift somebody from down there up to there. So let's be in the habit of lifting people. Let's get rid of all the negative all condemnation and let's speak words of encouragement to one another. Amen? Amen. Amen. Take the time to help someone grow. That's what we were talking about, the harvest. Help them to grow by encouraging them. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Good talking. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. God is in this house in a very, very deep way. Are we on or off? On. Thank you for watching.